Okay, all right, let's get started. So before we uh, go into the technical part of the class, right, there are several logistic issues. So one is uh, sort of changing office hours. Right, so apparently sort of having office on hours on Friday is not a good day. People want it closer to the homework due date. So I'm open to changing it. I'm open to changing it. But so I guess holding it on Monday or Wednesday doesn't you know, help all that much because if you have questions about homework, you can just you know, ask in class during the break or after class. So we can uh, try to have it either on Tuesday or Thursday. So does, for example, if we have the office hour, let's say Tuesday from 11.30 to 12.30, does that work? Okay, so we can do it, uh, you know, we can do it Tuesday. From, so we'll change from Friday to Tuesday from uh, 11.30 to 12.30. Does that make anybody life worse? Okay, all right. So, So this will be right after the uh, department seminar. Right, yeah, so in the future though, if you have this kind of uh, request, you know, just let me know, right? So I know this is a Discord, but again, I don't monitor Discord, so I don't know this, right? So if you guys have no requests like this, just it doesn't hurt to ask, right? Maybe not everything is possible, but this is definitely doable for us. Okay, so this is office hours. And then also we need to determine a midterm date. We need to determine midterm date. So the midterm date, the week that looks most reasonable will be either uh, the 3rd of May or the 5th of May. So this will be either be May Anybody has a issue against one of these things? Anybody have another exam on the same day? Any preference someone for one of these days? So the midterm will be one day long. Again, the midterm will be a take home day long midterm, a day long exam. The class time is used as the office hour to answer questions you, know, you may have about the midterm. So either day is all will be, you know, let's say uh, posted at 7 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. Then class time will be an office hour. That's kind of how we can use it. Okay. Right, so there's uh, many preferences. So we're not gonna satisfy people's preference, right? There's already voting for a third and fifth. So are there hard conflicts, right? So do you have other exams? Uh, let's not do a poll. We do a poll, we, we won't convert to an answer. So if you have a hard conflict, meaning you have another exam on the same day, uh, can you please speak up or stay in chat? Right, so I have a, there's a midterm for 447 on Wednesday, May 5th. Okay. Are there, do people have midterm on Monday? Are there exams on Monday? So the best we can do is to avoid two exams on the same day. Otherwise, it's hard to, you know, for preference, we, it's hard to satisfy everybody. 
So if there's no other exams on Monday, then we'll hold it on Monday. Okay, so we won't conflict with the exam on Wednesday, but we'll hold it on Monday. Does that work? Any people can do it on Monday? All right, Monday it is. Uh, okay, so 341 has midterm on Monday. Wait, which class is 341? How many people are taking it? I'm not. But there is a no processing. Uh, yeah, so we, we got to hold on one of these two days. So we, yeah, we may not. So we hold on the week before. We may not cover enough. We hold on the week after. It'd be probably too much for the midterm. So let's still say, let's still do it on Monday. The midterm is not, yeah, so the midterm is not overly long. It's a midterm you will, you will finish in class, so we did in class, right? The, do, the, way, the reason we do a take home is uh, just make everybody's life easier to do a take home. Okay, so there, you know, you can do it. You can fit, you, with structuring a way that you'll finish within two hours for sure, right? So the, the idea is to give you a chance to look at it in the morning. And then to ask questions that you may have during class time. Okay, all right. So that's the idea for the midterm. Okay, so now let's say, you know, let's say it's May 3rd, we do it on the Monday. Okay, so it's a take home exam. Uh, if you, you know, people discover conflicts that uh, really they cannot do it on this day, then let me know. We can try to find an alternative time. But for now, let's say it's Monday, May 3rd. Other questions? Okay, all right. Yeah, so again, in the future, you know, if you, there's are things like you want to move the office hour, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, one bad thing about teaching remotely as I don't know the discussion that's happening in class, right? So uh, the other things, other suggestions about class, what you like, what you don't like, what you like to see changed, let me know. Again, not everything is possible or feasible to do, but you know, things like changing office hours definitely possible. Will it be common going forward that you present stuff in lecture the day before the homework's due that's needed for the homework? Like the homework for last week, we learned stuff on that Wednesday, the day before the homework was due that was kind of needed for the homework. And then the slides and lecture weren't posted until Thursday afternoon. So it made kind of difficult to, to look back. So if that's going to happen, is it possible to try and post the slides and lecture video from the class sooner? Yeah, so sorry about that. So the slides will be posted right away. Yeah, so I'll post the slides right away after Wednesday. It's still possible that you may need the material for the homework though. It's, uh, we can't always guarantee that homework will run, say a week later than the lecture. So you may need it, but I will post the slides earlier, yes. Other suggestions? Okay, all right, yeah. So hopefully the homework will not be that much dependent on the lecture on Wednesday, but uh, Sometimes, especially in the beginning, or if some topics are very short, then it's still possible that uh, whatever we learn on Wednesday will be uh, will be due on the homework on Thursday. 
Right. So although, yeah, I will make sure I post the, the video and these slides uh, by Wednesday night at latest. Okay, all right. Yeah, also, if you have questions about the homework, you know, please ask you know, during class time, during the break in class or after class. Right? This is also you know, beneficial for other people who's in class who may have the same question or who didn't, who didn't you know, start looking at homework yet. Okay. So if you have questions, please ask. Uh, you know, we may have you know, harder material coming up in the class, right? So let's make sure that if you have a question, you ask about it. I also, again, this for this uh, remote instruction, I don't see the feedback in class, so I, I don't know what's hard, what's easy from your end, right? So you know, I may thought some things are easy, and uh, I give you on homework, but maybe that's you know, difficult, right? So please also let me know if that happens. Okay, all right. So going back to what we left off yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but last time. Last time we covered uh, DC to DC conversion, right? We have the bug converter and the boost converter. So bug converter was really simple, right? Bug converter was, for, uh, at least for our bug, right? for our bug, it was really simple to design a bug converter. It's just a switch. And then with a load at the end of the switch. And then if you have a boost converter, then the architecture for the converter is more involved because you have to store, that's you have to store power or you have to store energy to boost a voltage. So we do need an inductor as our storage element, a dial to avoid reverse power flow, a capacitor to hold the voltage as the output. Right, so those will boost the voltage from Vs to Vt. Okay. Then the next converter we'll cover is something called a buck boost converter. And this is a converter where we want to reverse the output. Right? So what we want to do is we want to make sure the sign of the output as a negative of the sign of the input. Okay, so this is what a buck boost converter does. So the goal is to reverse this, so have something like Vt equals to negative Vs. Right, so some multiple of Vs. And this is useful whenever you need to reverse the polarity of the, to, to reverse your polarity of the uh, source. Okay. So if your source is positive, you need to be negative, you have a buck boost converter. And then again, buck boost converter, you can think of it just a rearranging of the boost converter. Right. So indeed, what you can think of is you can think of this sort of converter as just some topology that has an inductor, capacitor, a diode, and a switch. Okay. So that's make how you make converters. And then if you make them one way, they're a boost. If you make them another way, they're a buck boost converter. Okay. So let's see how we make a buck boost converter. So here, a buck boost converter is a, another arrangement of a switch, right? So this IGBT is our bipolar, is our bipolar transistor, is our switch. We have a diode, an inductor, a capacitor, and a load. And the idea is to have the current. You can think of the reason we have a diode here is to get the current to go from this point, right? To go against the voltage. So here we can reverse 
the voltage. So we have a positive Vs, we have a negative Vt because we're pulling current out of the load, right? So you can think of the current as being pulled out of the load. So the voltage is negative. And the principal operation of this is similar to the boost converter. As you charge up this inductor right, during one switch cycle, then you discharge inductor, right, do it during the off cycle. And uh, we look at current balance to figure out the equations at the end of the day. So if you look at the bus boost converter, we want to look at when it's on, when the switch is on versus when the switch is off. Okay, so we're gonna focus on the inductor. So in this kind of circuits, the inductor acts like the main storage element. Right? So the way to analyze them is to focus on the inductor and then say, if the switch is on, what we have is the switch is connected. Right? The switch is connected to the source. So again, what happens in this case, if you directly connect the inductor to a DC source? Isn't it gonna charge? Right, it's gonna charge, right? So this thing will charge. So the, the current has to go this way, right? This is Vs as a source. So the inductor charges. The next we want to look at what happens when the circuit is off. Right? When the circuit is off, what happens to the current in the inductor? So now let's say this is off. So if this circuit is off, then all we have left is the inductor. Right? Now the source is disconnected from the rest of the circuit. And the source doesn't matter anymore as the switch is as an open circuit. So thus we have an inductor, we have a diode, a capacitor, and a let's say this is our load. Right. So in this case, what happens? Which way does current flow? It's still the same direction, right? Because of the position of the diode. Right. This is still the same direction because position of the diode, right? So this is that's why the diode is important. Right? Diode in the circuit controls which way the current flows. The diode forces this current has to flow this way. And then the current, right, has then the direction of current flow as current has flow like this. Therefore, the terminal, the positive terminal is here, the negative terminal is here. So that we can think of VT this way, right? We have to reverse the positive and the negative terminal on the load. So the capacitor, we're gonna assume what happens is the capacitor is small. Not, not the capacitor is small, the current through the capacitor is small. Okay, so I'm gonna assume the current through the capacitor So the capacitor is really there just to hold the voltage, output voltage at roughly constant level. Okay, so all we care about is basically the current balance in the inductor itself, right? the current balance in the inductor, and uh, we care, you know, and uh, this current, basically this sort of the current going back and forth being stored in the inductor creates a voltage as the output. And the diode is there to make sure the current goes in the correct direction. The diode is really forcing the current to only go in one direction. Okay. So this is the basic uh, operation principle of a buck boost. Okay. Okay, so now let's do our current balancing, right? So again, our operating principle is current, net current is conserved, right? We cannot, the 
inductor cannot have a non-zero average current. So whatever is stored during when the switch is on must be discharged when the switch is off. So that gives us an equation and that relates the output voltage to the input voltage. So same, it's very similar to the boost converter setting. So if you look at how much current is stored in this case, again, we use our, the voltage of the inductor equation. So this is L di dt. We're going to assume that the current is roughly constant in this case. So this is L delta I on over T on. But here, VL is equal to VS. Right? Direct, this is directly connected to a DC source. So we have the amount of current I build up as equal to Vs times T on divided by the inductance L. And so I build up this much current during the charging stage. Any questions for this? Okay, so I build this much current. Then the, let's look at how much current we discharge right, when the switch is off. So here we are discharging, or right, discharging. So here we have as VL, again, the voltage is equal to L, the current we have when the switch is off over DT. This is roughly minus L, right, where the current is going this way, going from top to bottom. So I have a minus sign, I off over T off. But here, because we have a capacitor, then we're gonna assume the voltage across all these elements is roughly constant through this period. So the voltage is equal to the voltage at the output. And there is no net current being stored in the inductor. So we have this equation combining with the equation up top. We can solve to get Vt as minus Vs T on over T off. This is our equation for a buck boost converter. So we, re we reverse the sign and the voltage level can go, you know, the voltage magnitude can go both up and down. Right? So this is, the sign is always reversed, but you know, there's a chance that uh, there's, by setting T on versus T off, you can get the voltage to go either, the magnitude to be either higher or lower compared to the source. Any questions? Uh, Alex asking the chat, do people ever use two buck boost converters in series to get non-inverted alpha? Uh, no, no. So it's very rare to see two of these in series, no. Uh, can people, right, so that's a good question actually. So why don't we do this? Why don't we chain converters together? We actually don't normally chain them together. We still want to use a one converter. For example, I think this question comes from the point that we have a buck, you can only go down. We have a boost, you can only go up. So it seems like if you chain a buck boost, two buck boosts converted together, you're very flexible, right? You can change to whatever level you want. Why don't we do this? So when you design this kind of converters, it's rare to say, oh, let me make a very flexible architecture that can do many things. That's actually quite rare. It's not efficient, so why is it not efficient? Where are you losing efficiency? So you do lose some power in inductor and capacitor. Uh, React, right, so, so let me address this in, 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 in a lot of comments, so let me address this. 
So first one says consume reactive power. There is no reactive power here because we're talking about DC circuits. Okay. The concept of reactive power only exists if we talk about AC circuits because it is the imaginary part of the AC power calculation, right? So we, we only talk about that if I have a phaser. We have DC circuits, there's no notion of reactive power. That's not defined, we, right? so we don't use phasers. An idea then said, right? So that it's also said the diode has a voltage drop, the inductor and capacitors has losses, so they're not ideal, so we have some loss. That is certainly one aspect of it, but also important and maybe more important as you really want to not use that many passive components. Okay, so that the reason is this inductor and capacitor are passive components. They are large. They are very large because they take a lot of space, and space is often of a premium in a lot of applications, and either in your cell phone or in an electric vehicle. You want space. Right? Space is important. So they're large. Sometimes they're heavy, and often they're not reliable. So if you look at a power converter and you ask, how does this thing break? Right? What breaks if you use a power converter many, you know, for a long time? The switch is often pretty reliable, pretty robust. It is the capacitor that breaks if you use it for a long time. So these components are bulky, large, expensive, heavy, and uh, not all that reliable. Okay? So you want to use us, you don't want to use many passive elements. Right, so you want to get get away with using as few of them as possible and using small ones. So that's why you see a lot of standards as in this application. You just do down conversion, so you design the best buck you can, right? Using sort of the smallest passive elements that you can. Okay, so you will see some questions, for example, that you know in homework or in exams says, I chain many converters together. Then what happens to these? But in practice, you want to do sort of the the best job you you do you have by right? using the smallest passive elements possible. And today again in research, the for the cutting edge research I think in power electronics design is finding ways to deal with the storage elements, right? If you don't use inductor, can use something else. You know, can use other types of capacitors. Uh, can you now get away with using one capacitor for different application, for different cover, this kind of ideas. I can come up with different other topologies that may need a smaller elements. These are important issues in the design. So Alex says, so is there more a more common non-inverting topology that goes above these, right? The last question is, what, have, what if I need to go you know, above and below for supply voltage? There are not that many applications that require you to go both above and below. Normally the convergence is one direction, actually. So you can imagine, let's say, take your computer as an example. You go from 120 to 12 to five to 1.2, I think, to something. So it's sort of one chain of convergence. It's not all that often you need to go both up and down. It's quite rare, it's quite rare. And if there are applications like that, then you use more uh, complicated designs, right? So here we present the basically three converters, buck, boost, buck, boost. But you can imagine you have other ways to arrange this, right? So but you have a good five, you have four elements to arrange, a switch, a dial, an inductor, and a capacitor. You can arrange them in more ways than three, right? We show three, there are other ways to arrange them and you get other converters. And then you can think of what if I have, you know, two switches, right? You know, two switches, two dials and things like this, then you can come up with other topologies. 
So tier three are the most common ones that will cover, I guess most of the application we'll see, but for specialized applications, you'll see other topologies, right? You know, what if I add a switch somewhere else? What if I add a dial, right? You know, let's go, what if I, right? For example, for this picture, what if I switch inductor and the capacitor, what happens? So all of these are the things you can do during the back. So I had a question when the switch is on. So why doesn't or does the capacitor <clears throat> uh, discharge to the inductor when the switch is on? Is it because the potential from the source and the capacitor are the same or does it discharge? Right, so that's a good question. Let's look at it. when it's on, when it's on. So let's say when this is on, what is the voltage at uh, two sides of the dial? Let's look at it. So this is my switch. So I'm going to draw its close switch here. This is my inductor. This is my dial. This is my capacitor. This is my load. Okay. Let's look at the voltage across the diode. What's the voltage on this side? VS. VS. What's the voltage on this side? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming VS since it doesn't go, but. No, no, no. VT, right? This is connected to the output load. This is VT. This is VS. Right, so VT, remember, is negative of VS. Okay, so the diode has a lower voltage at the end of, right? So this diode cannot conduct, this diode doesn't conduct. So the diode stops from the rest of the circuit doing, from doing anything to the inductor. So then, so then VS is just making its way through because I'm assuming the capacitor is there to decrease voltage ripple, just like in the other converters, correct? Right, to hold a constant at VT. Hold the output, right, roughly constant at VT. So then when the switch is on and the, the voltage source is charging the inductor, right. how is the capacitor holding the voltage high because it, it it can't go right right because then it would be going the opposite direction of current so so you do have a current going this way right? this is a capacitor this is the way the capacitor current is going yeah and you have a charging current going this way this is fine this this right. dial essentially makes the circuit open in the middle it's an open circuit if you have a dial right. gotcha thank you sir Di yeah dial outside like open circuit so they're not re the two parts are essentially decoupled in the setting Okay, so that's a good question. Any other questions about this conceptual? So dial, dials are important. Dials are important to have. Okay, and again, our dials are, you know, our voltage are much higher than 0 0.7 volts. So we're not gonna care about the 0 0.7 volts the dial has. So in this case, assume the dial is acting like a perfect open. Right? All right, so this is our diode. So this is our equation. This is our equation. Okay, so it's not a very uh, tricky equation. So it's quite short equations, writing it again. Okay. So if we write this, if we write an equation like this, right? So it seems T on and T off can be any number that we want, right? This equation seems to work. But in practice, T off cannot be too small. Okay, you cannot have a T off that's very close to zero. Right? That makes your voltage very high and doesn't give you enough time to discharge the inductor. So you may run that you will run into saturation of the inductor. Right? So even if we write an equation like this, but still keeping in mind that during practice, there are some limits on how large Ti and Tof can be. Right? So Tof cannot be too small. You need time for inductor to discharge, right? to, to, to sort of get rid of the current it has. Right? So again, for ideal components, 
which we assume most of the time parallel is equal to parallel. Right? So it doesn't matter what you do to the voltage polarity, the power is conserved from input to output. Right? The power doesn't change. Right? So then if we look at a buck boost converter, then that's, so let's do some example questions. So here we're saying we have a buck boost converter with an input voltage of 20 volts, and uh, we have a 10 ohm load. It's given the switching frequency. So we want the on time loss transistor and the output power when the load voltage is 10 volts or when the low voltage is 40 volts. Right? We want to compute the on time and the power. Right? So the weight, again, for all those questions, the question will tell you what kind of converter it is. Right. And uh, they just come down to a lot of times using the right equation for the right converter. Right. So again, a common mistake is to you know, use the wrong equation. <laughs> use the wrong equation for the converter. Right. So you know, be careful to read the question, use the right equations. Okay. So once you, know, you, fit, you find the equation, all those questions are not very hard, right? So VT is 10 volts, let's see what they, so the period is one over switching frequency, one over five kilohertz, 0.2 milliseconds. So have VT equals to Vs T off over T off. Okay. And so we know this is a buck boost, right? So even though the question says the low, low voltage maintained at 10 volts, the way to use this equation is to put a minus sign in VT. Okay, so it's minus 10 volts equals to minus 20 volts times T on over T off. So it's important to have the, have the signs be correct because you divide negative 20 over, we get T on over T off equals to 10 over 20 and T on plus T off equal to 0.2 milliseconds. Then we can solve the equations to get T on equals to 0 0.0667 milliseconds. Okay, so this is the on time of the switch, right? So for this question, it's important to have the minus sign in front of minus 10, in front of 10. Right. So such that T on over T off as a positive fraction. Then here power is VT squared over R. So 10 squared over 10, 10 watts. Same calculation for the VT equals 40 volt case. We have minus 40 equals to minus 20 T on over T off. Everything the same as before. Solving these two equations together give you TL uh, 0 0.133 milliseconds. Power is VT squared over R, 40 squared over 10, 160 watts. Okay, so this is our uh, boost cover. Sorry, the back boost cover. The questions for this example? All right, okay. So again, this is simple, right? You just need to solve this uh, very simple equation. All right, so I'm guess, I'm assuming we all, we're all okay solving equations like this. I have you know, linear equations with two unknowns. Okay, good. All right, so that covers our DC to DC conversion, right? So again, DC to DC conversion, we have three different converters. Okay, so if you look at where we are is we cover DC, AC to DC, that's a rectifier circuit. Then we have covered DC to DC. The next we'll go over DC to AC. 
And this is relatively simple. There's not much to, so it's much simpler than the other two. Because, uh, you know, for, our, for us, we just need to get it to have both positive and negative parts. Right? So what for us as our converter, as what we want to do is we have a DC source and we want a AC voltage from A to B. So here, what we want is we want VAB to be AC. The AC here means both positive and negative part. Right. We're not making it a sinusoid. We're just going to make it have both positive and negative parts. So you can think of this as a circuit that uh, controls your, that's interfaces between, say, a solar cell and your home or a battery at your home where you need to do DC to AC conversion. And this is literally a, basically a bridge, a full, a full wave rectifier run backwards. Okay, this is a full wave rectifier where you switch where the source and the load is. Because the way we do it is we simply synchronize the switching. Right? We have a source. So half the time, we're going to make sure that Q1 and Q2 are on. These are the switches. And then another half the time, we're going to make sure that Q3 and Q4 are on. So we get our nice AC wave. So we get this AC wave. So we'll do filtering. The sinusoid, but we're not going to do filtering here. So for us, we're just going to get a plus minus to both sides. Uh, any questions about this setup? Uh, you just have four switches and you toggle them. Okay, so in practice, what are the, what's, what's the important design consideration here? We have switching like this. Making sure they're on for the same amount of time. One is making sure they're on for seven five times. Second is do not turn, for example, Q1, Q3 on at the same time. Right? You don't want to short your source. So the logic is important. So the switching logic is important. You want to make sure that you don't short anything. Right? So make sure you don't switch them prematurely. Right? Make sure that you know, if a fault happens, the switch default is open and not closed. Right? So making sure like this. Yeah, so right, so this is a switching logic, right? So it's important to switch them in the correct sequence. So we're gonna assume that's done correctly. But again, when you design this kind of circuits, this is you know, what you worry about and what you test. Right? Yeah. So you don't want to timing issues. Right? Here, the timing issue is important. You don't want to have a timing issue or two switches that should not be on at the same time or on at the same time. And this will show your circuit. So once you avoid that, then the rest of the analysis is actually quite easy. So there's no new equation here. There's no new equation here. Okay, there's no new equation here. So the reason there's no new equation here is, you know, if you have an AC circuit like this, AC output like this, it's pretty simple to compute things like RMS voltage across the load and the average voltage across the load. So we can do all of these a very straightforward way, and, you know, very straightforward way, right? So it's here, right? So here we have a single phase AC. We have a source that's 100 volts, a sun switching frequency. So what's it? we want to know the average cross the load. We want to know the RMS cross the load. So this is simple to do. What is the average across the load? Zero, right? Zero, yeah. There's nothing half. It's AC, right? So by definition, it's zero. If it's not zero, we have some problems with circuit design. 
What's the RMS? Is it still Vmax over square root of two? No, there's no Vmax here. Right. So in this equation, there's no Vmax. That's a DC source of 100 volts. So what is the RMS of this AC square wave? 100 volts. 100 volts. <laughs> right. So this is, a, this is a question that sometimes trips people up. As you immediately see AC and think of this as Vmax over square root 2. This is not that. Right? Because we have a square wave. So if you do RMS squared, if you square this thing, what do you get? You get Vs squared, and there's a constant. It's a source is 100 volts. So you square it, that's Vs squared, positive negative part to the same value. So it is a constant. Then you can do the mean and take a square root, it's still 100 volts. Okay, so here the RMS is equal to the source voltage. Right? We're not, again, making it into a sinusoid in this application in here. Right, we're just keeping as a square wave. We, did, we didn't do filtering. So this is the same, the RMS is the same as input source voltage. So after filtering though, that wouldn't be true anymore, correct? Right, after filtering the Vmax will not be Vs, for example. Right? After filtering Vmax will not be Vs. But we are not doing filtering. Right? So in this class, we don't do that. So is this, for this question, it is just Vs. Okay, it's not Vs over square root of two. Okay, so just Vs. So this is important to remember, right? Just sort of not to lose the uh, free points on exams. Other questions? Okay, all right. So this is our DC to AC, and we won't cover anything that's you know more complicated than this architecture. Right, so again, we can make it three phase, which is more you know, which is used for things like wind. But we'll get to it when we cover three phase systems. Right, so for now, this is our AC DC conversion. And this is our DC AC conversion. And then we can do AC-AC converters, right? And that this AC-AC converter for us is just chaining two SCRs back to back. And what this allows you to do is this allows you to change the, for example, the RMS voltage. Right? This allows you to flexibly change the RMS voltage at the output. This gives you a way to tune it. And this, by sending different uh, triggering pulses when you trigger the SCRs. So this is a flexible AC to AC converter. If you compare this some, to something like transformers, transformers is normally have a set uh, ratio between the output and the input. Or here, as you can, by you know, electronically triggering, you can have different uh, VRMS as the output. And the, two, and the equation here, again, is really not all that complicated because we're just chopping off part of a sinusoid, right? If we have triggering angle of alpha, we chop part of it off. So the equation becomes really sort of simple. The average is still zero, right? The, 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 the mean is still zero, you still have equal positive part and negative part, that didn't change. That did not change. And the RMS voltage, okay? RMS voltage is actually something we computed from before. Okay? So if you integrate this, if you, you know, just compute RMS voltage through the, integrate, through the integrals, you'll find the RMS voltage as Vmax, square root two, one minus alpha over pi plus sine two alpha over two pi. If, right, this is the equation we have seen before, because again, 
We have seen this actually for a AC to DC converter. So if you have AC to AC converter, you have both positive and negative parts. So the average is zero, but the RMS value is the same value as we computed for AC to DC converter. So that did not change too much. That, that, that's the same exact equation as before. Any questions about this AC to AC conversion? Okay, so lastly for conversion is, again, we'll see this type of AC to AC converter, although not a lot. More often as you see AC to AC converter that goes into an AC to DC, then the DC to AC stage. Uh, this is what you will see more often as AC to AC. And this is a lot higher performance. This are more flexible, higher performance. Again, it allows you to have something like you know, different frequencies on both sides. I can isolate frequency. So this is used often in wind turbines. When we get to uh, machines, we'll get to how this is used in a wind turbine to isolate two parts of the turbine, turbine to isolate frequency. And another big application you'll see is uh, in UPS, right, in backup power supply, as you convert AC to DC, you charge a battery through the DC link, then you convert from DC to AC back. Right? You'll see this in a power supply as well. You'll see this in variable motor drives. Right? So if the AC motor requires different uh, speeds, and often makes sense to add a this AC to AC conversion stage so you can achieve different speeds for the motor. And this is especially useful if you're running a big HVAC system. So if you look at the ECE building, if you look at the ECE building, on the top floor, there's a lot of HVAC equipment. And there, there will be HVACs running through different, uh, at different speeds, at different variable speed drives. So that's where, the, in our building, we actually have quite a bit of conversion, power conversion going on. We have three phase AC power coming to the building, we'll do a conversion, then we'll run motors, HVAC motors at different speeds. So this is going on, for example, you know, I'm sitting in my office, so the air circulation that you control by this kind of variable speed HVAC motors. All right, and again, something we mentioned before is you know, DC transmission. As you can have a DC lines between two points in a grid for increased flexibility. Okay, so this finishes our, our conversion for us. Again, the big thing for this class is rectifier circuits. That means DC, AC to DC, and then DC to DC conversion. So three different ones. Okay. Any questions about the power converters? Okay, right, so if not, then let's take a break. We'll come back at 3.36. We'll go on to energy resources and the power generation. So a little bit bigger grid issues. All right, so let's take a break. And again, if you have questions about homework or other things, you can definitely ask during the break. All right, thanks. Okay, all right, let's get started again. Okay, so this is sorry. So before again, as a, where we're going in the class, as we've been talking about energy conversion, right? how do you convert from one form of energy, one form of voltage to AC to another form DC? But now we're going to talk about energy resources. Uh, how do you generate power? Where does power come from? Right, how do you generate power? So this. For the second half of today's lecture, we'll cover the you know, different sources of power, uh, the characteristic of the load, 
And then we'll start covering how do you generate power? How do you generate from wind and the solar? Then we talk about how do you generate from more traditional sources like you know gas and coal and nuclear. Right? So that's for the next two weeks where we're, where we're going. We're done with energy conversion. Now we're at energy generation. Right? How do we generate power from, how do we generate electric power from other sources? Right? So if you look at energy sources, then there are you know, many sources of energy. Right? We have fossil fuels. So this is oil, coal, gas. We have nuclear. We have renewables. These are the big ones. These are the big sources of power. Can you think of another energy source that's not here? That's relatively small, but does happen. So it's not a fossil fuel. So geothermal is normally renewable. If you have geothermal, you use geothermal. That's a renewable resource. Mechanical is really not. No, we don't have much. Tidal is also renewable, right? These are, you know, so tidal is you know, same as wood, right, basically. Well, that's renewable. What's a non renewable source of power that we don't? Right? So in the US, what you see for non renewable power is a lot of places you basically burn garbage. You have garbage burning and use that to generate power. So that has actually, you see a couple of power plants in this region that uh, has to be on all the time. And the reason that they're, they're burning trash and uh, they have to be dispatched. They don't care basically if they, you know, so a lot of times they don't care if they make money from generating power, but they have to burn trash. You know. So they may just well generate power from it. So while I was working at a system operator, you know, there was a couple of plants that has a very strange category. Right? They are must on plants, but they're not nuclear. Then I figure out later they're actually burning garbage and generating you know, somehow. Okay, so that's a so different regions have this sort of quirks. You know, the so different plants that generate power, but majority of our power are generated from these three types: so fossil fuel, nuclear, and renewable. So if you look at renewable, right? So, you know, we, right now, of course, we kind of care a lot more about renewable. If you count hydro as renewable, the hydro is still by far the largest renewable source we have. This is still by far the largest one. Hydro, if you have hydro, hydro is a very good source of renewable power. There's wind, of course, solar, of geothermal, if, if we have access to geothermal, we can use geothermal, we may not always have access to it. We have tidal waves. Biomass is really depend how you define. It's just really hard, depend on your exactly how you define renewable or define biomass that may not be a may or may not be renewable resources. So but the large ones are hydro, wind, solar. In the US, obviously the three largest ones are hydro, wind, and solar, with hydro still being you know, that generates the most power. So in this class, we'll cover all of you know, this generation technologies. We'll cover hydro, wind, and solar, and we'll cover sort of how conventional generators work. Okay, we'll cover all of them. All right, so these are the main generation resources. Again, if you think about this general resources, it's important to think about, you know, how much of this is, so normally what we like to think, the way to think about is to think of things as, you know, conventional, 
meaning these are the power plants that has been operating for a while and then renewable being newer type of generation technology. So hydro is in the middle. We've been building hydroelectric dams for a long time, but it, so it's a conventional generation technology, but still it's the renewable technology. So this is fossil, nuclear, and this is sort of wind, solar, da, da, da. And so these are the two different resources we have, two different types of resources we have. So of course the question for us to look at is, now what happens in the future, right? Which ones, which ones dominate? Right? So right now, what we want to see is, what is the generation mix? Right. That means if you break down the resources, how much power is each resource generated? Right. That's the, what we want to see. So let's look at today. And again, we're going to focus on the US because each country is different. Each country is different. So let's look at the US or the North American grid. What generates most power? Which resource generating the most electric power for us in the US? It's gas. Gas or natural gas is number one for now. Gas has undergone a pretty good growth in the last you know, 10, 15 years. As gas is quite high in there. Gas is basically about 40 some percent. So it's its own category. Then you have hydro, you have wind. I think you have solar, then you have coal, right? So coal is really a small mixture of the jet, oh, sorry, nuclear. Nuclear, forgot about nuclear generation. But again, coal is really not all that much anymore in the US. Okay. So if you look at people, you know, there's sometimes you hear people say that Renewable or displacing coal or something like that. That's not the case, actually. Most of the coal plants has been displaced by gas plants. Right? And then renewable has certainly seen growth. But right now the system is, you know, has a lot of gas plants in it. And coal plants are looking like they're, most of them will be retired in the next you know, one or two decades. So then as you know, looking into the future, the idea, so this is what we have today. But as an engineer and as if you're looking at technology or as doing investing, what we want to know is, you know, in the next 10 years, what happens, 20, 30, right? So what happens to our mixture, generation mixture? Uh, so is natural gas or methane including gas? Uh, gas is predominantly uh, natural gas. Natural gas is most of it. We have a lot of natural gas. Really, that was a big shift in the last 15, 20 years. As gas is really cheap. And you see a lot of gas generation. Right. So the question is, you know, where are we going in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Right. Are we is, you know, is gas gonna grow more? Is you know wind and solar really are we you know, are we gonna get to hundred percent renewables? Right? Can we get there? What happened to coal? What happens to nuclear? All of these are the questions that we ask. Okay. And this is really a complicated question. This is a really, really complicated question. There are many, many people thinking about uh, this question. Uh, where is the generations going? Right? Where is the system going? So uh, for us, as what we will do is we'll take a look at the EIA. We'll take a look at EIA. Okay. As, so a good resource for you to have if you're interested in this type of questions is to look at the Energy Information Agency. What this agency does is collects all the data, collects a lot of data about the energy system in the US. 
It's a pretty good data set. It's a pretty comprehensive data set. And then we'll try to you know, do a little bit of forecasting of the future. Right? We'll try to say, okay, given the system is you know, what it is today, what happens in the future? Right? What happens to our, uh, how, how will the system evolve in the future? And this evolution depends on many factors, depends on the policy, depends on the cost, uh, depending on you know, whether we have some unforeseen events in the grid, right? But so this is a best guess of what will happen in the future. And then key to remember here is you know, all predictions are wrong, right? but some are useful. So the hope is, you know, we often use these predictions as a guide for what will happen in the future, right? The goal is really not to hold this prediction, you know, not to look at absolute numbers in this prediction, in these predictions, but rather to look at the trends in these predictions, right? Rather to look at, uh, rather to look at, or you know. The changes in mixture, not the absolute number in these predictions. Okay. So the data we'll use is coming out of EIA. EIA is a, so if you're interested, you have some free time, you can definitely go play around in this website. There's a lot of information there. Help us think about you know, both where the current system is and where it's going. So do they take <laughs> political implications and, and policies in the because obviously right now it's not a secret that there's a huge political push for, for green power and the new green deal and all that. So does the EIA take that stuff in or do they strictly go by just kind of, you know, what's being used and what's available? Okay, so that's a good question. So today for, right, for the current data set, it is whatever the data is. For future projections, they will try to project different scenarios. Right? They'll try to project different scenarios. Uh, today, the push is so, yeah, so, so we'll try to project different scenarios. So we'll try to say, okay, you know, if we want to get to 100% renewables, this is what happens. If we want to do everything by gas, this is what happens. So EIA is not a policy setting entity. They do not set policy. Their job is to say, you know, take different policy ideas or different, uh, for different goals and try to say, this is how the energy usage will evolve. This is how the energy usage will go. Okay. And uh, you can take a look at that. And uh, you know, we often use that to then inform policy and do the situation. Okay. Try to figure out what is the, right, so given a, you know, let's say this is what we think will happen. If we have different scenarios, this is what will happen. So one example, so this is total energy consumption. So this is everything. This is not just electricity, right? So this, this is not just electricity. This is all energy consumption. Right? This is all energy consumption. So transportation, for example, is including this. Okay. So if you look at this US energy consumption, then you have different, uh, but I say what EIA does is okay, I can give you different projections. Suppose you have high economic growth, right? This is what will happen. You know, suppose you have low economic growth, right? So COVID happens, then this is the bottom line. And then we'll try to look at different possibilities. What happens if the prices are different? Right? What happens when different price happens? Okay. So this is the energy consumption. So the, our energy consumption is relatively flat. The picture you should take away from this kind of projection is, you know, our energy consumption is not gonna change drastically, no matter you know, what happens. Over a wide variety of scenarios, our energy consumption is roughly flat, it will maybe increase a little bit, right? May go up by say 10% in 20 years, may go down 10% in 20 years, but will roughly remain the same, right? Then you can ask a question. If you look at this as energy consumption, then you can ask a question. Right? Suppose our goal, climate goal, is try to reduce our CO2 emissions 
I saw, you know, but what I work on is basically integration of renewables, right? So what, you know, what I work on is trying to make the grid uh, more sustainable. Right? Then if you look at energy production like this, it's like, we're really not gonna use less energy. <laughs> we're gonna probably use a little bit more energy in the next 20 years. But how do we, how do we get, how do we get carbon emissions go down? Right? How do we get the CO2 emissions to go down by say 50% in the next 20 years? If we're not gonna change our consumption or consumption stays roughly flat. Right. So is that possible for the folks in the class? Is it possible? Can I make CO2 emission go down if our consumption doesn't go down? Right. right. So of course it's possible. And this already been, has been happening, right? This has already been happening. If you look at something called carbon intensity. So what carbon intensity calculates is, right? So what carbon intensity calculates is a ratio. This is the CO2 emission. So this is the emission per energy usage, unit of energy. And we've been getting pretty efficient. We've been getting quite efficient. If you look at historical trend, so this is today, if you look at this trend, it's roughly something like this. It's actually already going down by quite a bit. And this mainly comes from gas. So up until now, this comes from the fact that we're shifting away from, so this downward trend is one as shift to gas. Another is more efficiency. Right. Our vehicles are really a lot more efficient than before. Vehicle efficiency, building efficiency, and the shift to gasoline generation for power. Okay. So what our goal is to keep making go to you know, keep have this thing go down, right? So we don't need to reduce any economic productivity. We don't need to reduce energy consumption. Really. So really the key point, perhaps is not to reduce energy consumption, is to do it more efficient, right? So do it using a different mixture of generation resources rather than big reduction in consumption. Right? It's to make this per unit measure go down. Right? So gas will get us somewhere. You know, gas has fundamentally has a floor. Right? So you know, it gotten us pretty, you know, has done good work, but then the goal is to shift to more, more renewables to keep having this ratio go down in the future. So this is again a, a projection idea, right? So if you look at this chart, this is a few mix. So the projection is to, so this is a little bit outdated, but it gives us a good trend line. So this is again the, entire energy fuel mix for the US. So if you look at the history, this is a very much a trend upwards for natural gas. And this is very much trend upwards for natural gas. Coal going down quite a bit lower, renewable trying to pick up. And then what the big electric vehicle push is trying to do Right. What is the EV push, the EV initiative? You, know, you may be hearing a lot in the news to trying to do is to convert this petroleum. This is really gasoline for your vehicles. This or the ground line is to bend this thing downwards and to use more renewables as a generation. Okay. It's trying to have this kind of trend line. So this is where the future forecasting become useful. EIA can make a forecast. So just based on market prices, this is the shift. Now, if you want to accelerate this shift, if you want to you know, even reduce your emission, if you want to reduce our emission, then this will tell us 
how to shift between different uh, resources. Any questions about this? So this is a system view. This is if you look at the entire energy system in the US, it, we typically look at this type of curves. Questions about this curves about a few mix? Okay, so for this, if you look at this curve, as you know, if we, well, this will basically tell you is we tapped out on hydro. We don't have that much hydro left to tap out. Okay, so a question from Adam, which renewable has the largest potential for growth expansion? That's a good question. Let's think about what we think. So, what, so from your guys' perspective, which renewable resources do you think have the most potential? So good hydro is pretty much tapped out. We, we, it's really hard to build more hydro. So wind and solar is for sure. Uh, fusion, I don't know whether it will happen in my lifetime. Right? You know, may happen. Yeah, may happen in your, you guys' lifetime. May not happen in my lifetime. Uh, so wind and solar are the big ones. So, but the question is always wind or solar for the US. We don't have that much tidal potential in the US. So what do you think? Do you think more wind is more likely or solar is more likely? Why wind? I think uh, personally from what I've heard, I think solar takes up way too big of a footprint for, for the efficiency of it that you get back is usually the big holdup. And so I think wind uh, is already more dominant. And so advances in technology to make wind turbines more efficient and uh, a smaller footprint, I think is probably more likely than making solar more personally. Okay, so any advocate for solar? Anybody is a believer for solar? Okay, so if you look at wind and solar, if we look at wind and solar, so wind and solar are actually both turning up, but they're turning up in different ways. So wind is really turning towards big generation. So wind is really turning towards building things like a 10 megawatt turbine. Right? You can build this offshore, for example. So wind is turning towards sort of big transmission level generation farms. You have build a big wind farm. You can build a lot of big wind turbines. You can generate a lot of power. Solar is turning towards a more distributed idea because it's very hard to build wind close to where people are. You just don't like, you know, it's hard to build a big wind turbine, right, in a city. Whereas solar is easier to build on people's rooftops. It's easier to build you know, on close to where people are. So right now the research trend is how do you, right? So the question of integrating solar and wind is actually quite different tech, you know, technically. Wind is how do you build big? How do you get a lot of power from one place to another place where there's a lot of uncertainty in one wind farm? Whereas solar is everything's very spread out. So how do you deal with you know, a million households all having solar? Right, so that's a research question. Right, so uh, these are the questions. Now we're trying to answer, try to integrate renewables. But you should keep in mind that's not different technologies or have different uh, use cases, right? Different use cases. So if you're interested, you should uh, take uh, 450 watt, which is offered next winter. And that's really goes in depth about integration of renewables covering wind, solar, and storage. Right? So that's the next class to take after 351, as will really cover how to integrate different types of renewable energies. Right, so before we're going on, as uh, right, so uh, right, so fusion is planned to work in 2050. Right, so I did not mean to say future fusion is impossible, but uh, really, you know, the fusion works great. Right, so that's again you know, fundamentally has for fundamental advantages fusion, but right now at least planning for the 
goal of 2030, 2040, uh, sort of a lot of is thinking about the sort of integration of wind and solar. So the future eventually comes online, it's great. And again, nuclear it doesn't look like we'll have more nuclear generation. It's hard to see, building more nuclear. Gas will probably have more. Coal will be mostly retired or all retired in the next few decades. So it'll be an interesting training mixture. So why is it hard to see more nuclear? Try building a nuclear power plant anywhere and see what happens. I try, try building it. Uh, Try to say, oh, I want this land to be a new nuclear power plant. That's not, you, know, you need a lot of political capital to push that through. It's just not easy building a nuclear power plant. Okay. So you know, there's good things by nuclear, right? It's a very stable power generation. It's very reliable. It doesn't, it requires very little fuel. It's all very good things about it, but still it's a nuclear generation station. So whether we can build more or not as a open question, and they really doesn't think that will happen. It's hard to see what building significantly more. So the future grid is turning towards something that's, or at least in the short term, a mixture of gas, wind, solar, plus storage. And the interesting question of how this grid will work. That's something we haven't quite worked out yet, right? But uh, Again, the mission thing that then take something like uh, 454. We'll get into more detail about sort of how this kind of big grid will work. But from a practicality standpoint, um, first, obviously, we live in one of the cloudiest, rainiest areas right. in the country. And so, has solar gotten to the point where it's efficient enough that even somewhere like here, where we don't really see the sun except for three months out of the year, is it still? a reliable and, and efficient enough source that you could still get use out of it year round, or is it still depend on, you know, the South Southern states being effective? Right, so that's a good question. That's a good question. That's really goes to, uh, that's for a good engineering question. So if you live somewhere in Arizona, what you do is you build solar and you don't need much backup, right? Solar is, can provide most of energy. For us, solar, it seems solar will not really be able to replace 100%, I mean, to not be able to generate 100% of power. But the question of solar is, you know, can you generate 20% of it? And that 20% often makes a lot more, makes a big difference. Again, the use case, you can think of the, our UW campus, right? So our campus gets power from CLC light. Again, as we said before, is we're going up against our transformer limit. So we have a transformer. That transformer has a capacity. We're going up against that capacity. So the idea, for example, for UW to put in solar and storage is not to say, I don't need the grid. but to say the grid maybe can give me 85% of what I need. The rest 15% I need to get from somewhere else. And that's where solar and storage makes a lot of sense. So that's where it's very useful. Without that, you know, we can supply power, but with it, there's a combination of solar storage plus the traditional grid, the distribution grid. We can get to, you know, we can supply all the power we want. So it's not always a binary decision. It's more of a, that does it make sense to generate 20% of electricity by solar? Right? Does it make sense to have storage that's, you know, that doesn't store all the power we need, but stores some of the power we need. Often the things on the margins that makes the biggest difference. It's often that makes a big difference. But even for Pacific Northwest, having some solar is, will be very useful as well. Especially if we hit against capacity limits. Yeah, I guess that was kind of my question. Yeah, like yeah. during the winter months, how much on average does UW get from solar? Like I'm guessing during the summer months hitting that 15% is not an issue, but during the winter months, is it still able to yeah, achieve still, that you, much? Yeah, or? you can still get significant amount. You get significant amount, yeah. We're better than Germany. So Germany has a lot more solar than us. We're better. Seattle is better than Germany. So uh, it's not, well, it's not California. It's not Southern California, but it's not nothing. It's significant especially have uh, some storage to go with it or some demand response to go with. 
right? So we'll do solar calculations and uh, we'll do this for specific numbers later. We'll sort of compute how much power can get out of it. We'll do efficiency, right? So it's, 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 it's quite a bit, it's, it's, it will be helpful actually, even in the winter months, even in the winter months. Okay, so this is the few mix of our, uh, from the whole system's perspective. The next thing we think of is, uh, you know, so this is from the system level, from the policy level. But then you have the other side of the people who's building generation plants. As do I get to build, you know, plants are built nowadays by individual investors. Can I build a plant? How do I think about, is it worth my while to build a power plant somewhere? So you'll see this as people will talk about, this is what's captured by something called capacity factor. The capacity factor is really a usage measure. Right? It's the amount of energy you produce divided by the total amount of energy you could have produced. And we want this capacity factor to be right, fairly high because a low capacity factor means that you may not be making your fixed cost back. Right? You have capital cost. You want a high capacity factor to recover this. Right, it's the utilization of your asset. So this is what you often compute if you work for, let's say of some of you, go work for a generation company and you do, you'll be doing a lot of this kind of calculation. It's how long you know, do I think the power plant will be up throughout the year? If you can get something like 80% uh, capacity factor, that's pretty good. 80, so in this example, 80% is not bad. 80% is not bad. So you want to utilize a lot of, you want the capacity to be high because you know, you're putting some capital investments into this, right? You want to get, you don't want to leave money on the table. You want to use the power plant you have built to, you know, to generate power and uh, make money or at least recover cost. Right? That's what you want to do in this case. So if you work for the generation company, you want to have a high, high, capacity factor. Right. So what causes a, so nothing has a capacity factor of 100%. And what causes this is normally a lot of issues. One is you may not have heat. So you have a gas plant. You may not be always be able to buy gas. You have a wind, there's maybe no wind on that day. Your plant may have a problem and has to undergo an outage for you to fix the problem. Your plan may be operating, but the operator doesn't want to use your plan because it's too costly. Or there may be environmental issues that sort of prevent your plans from being used. So if you look at these, if you look at this for capacity factors, What do you think the different capacity factor is? So let's have a guess, let's have a guess. We're gonna only look at US. For coal, what do we think the capacity factor is? So if you build a coal power plant, so 40% uh, is not bad. We're about, you know, about 60% or so, about 60% or so. Which generation has the highest capacity factor? Not hydro, no, not hydro. Nuclear, right, nuclear. Nuclear is really high, it's, right? If you build a nuclear generation power plant, the only thing it does is to generate power. So this is normally larger than 90%. It really doesn't do other things. It just sits there to generate power. And it's hard to turn a nuclear power plant off. The nuclear has a very high capacity factor. Hydro is roughly 40% for the US. The reason is hydro normally has to do many things. Right? You have to irrigation. For Washington state, you have to make sure you know fishery is taken care of. So you, you may not always generate power 
where you may often trade off power generation versus other uses for hydro. Okay, so it's not you know, that high, not 100%, but different considerations. Then you have for wind and solar. Together, you have something about, so this is around nowadays about 30%. Okay. So you have different capacity factors. And when you build a plant, you have to think about the capacity factor. So often you see things on the news or some report as I build a two gigawatt power plant. The question you know, we should always ask is, okay, you build a two gigawatt plant, but what is the capacity factor? Right? How often is a plant being used? Do you always generate a close to two gigawatt or do you generate some of the time? So that goes into, it's a difference between accounting for capacity versus accounting for the energy you can actually generate out of the plant. Oh, so a question about concentrated solar. Concentrated solar is in here solar. Uh, this is grouped together here with solar. So we'll go into concentrated solar more later when we talk about solar generation. But in this kind of accounting, it's grouped together with solar PV, for example. So what's the, the average? Other, sorry, yeah. what's the average break even for for wind and solar then? Because that kind of not saying it does, but it definitely just contradicts what you just said about needing a high capacity factor to to make it worthwhile doing. So if it's so low, then why do they continue building them? No, no. So what I mean is, you want you need to look at the capacity factor. Whether thirty percent is high or low, right? That, that's a separate question. Thirty percent for wind and solar may not be very low, right? Thirty percent may not be very low for wind and solar. So it's important to know what the capacity factor is. But for different technology, different capacity factor makes sense. Okay? So for example, you have a coal, then it's operating at 30% capacity factor does not make sense. For something like wind or solar operating at 30% capacity factor may very well make a lot of sense. Okay? One big difference, for example, is wind and solar have essentially zero fuel cost. You do not have any fuel cost for wind and solar. So you build it and the operating cost is very, very low. Right? So if, you, if you're on, you're often making, you know, just making money, right? There's no operating cost, you're on, right? So this depending on if you just on 25% of the year, you make quite a bit of money. For example, if you're in Seattle, if you can just, you know, if your solar only operates from June to August, let's say, or June to September, that would actually save you a significant amount of money in Seattle. So that 30% is a good make sense. If it's more spread out in the year for solar one, you may not have, you don't have fuel cost, that will make sense. There are maybe environmental factors you can consider, that makes sense. You have storage, then suddenly 30% 30, 30 doesn't look so bad. Right? So all this comes into consideration. So what I, I don't want to say is 30% is low. Of course, we want to get to high. But your break even point is different for different technology mixes. So it's very important to do an apple to apple comparison and not compare capacity factor across technologies. Yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, so okay. So if not, then let's end the lecture here today. Next class, we'll talk about demand. Then we'll go into actual generation technology. So we'll talk about solar generation, wind generation, then conventional generation like nuclear and coal. Okay, so we'll talk about demand by looking at what our electric demand looks like. Then we'll go into generation technologies. Okay. As a reminder, again, what we decided earlier in the class is uh, my office hours are moved to Tuesday from 11.30 to 12.30. That'll be updated on the course website. Then the midterm will is on Monday, May 3rd. Okay. All right, okay, thanks guys. And uh, see you on Wednesday.